Hey, Mr. P here. Hey, it's Mr. Schmitz. In this video, we're going to talk specifically about species interactions, all about symbiosis and symbiotic relationships. Let's go. So, symbiosis is a synonym, a, a shortened version of the term symbiotic relationship, uh, which we would define as a close interdependent relationship between two different species. And a couple of important notes there. Interdependent, meaning that they are going to be relying on each other in some capacity. And different species, meaning it has to be two different kinds of species. It cannot just be like two grizzly bears teaming up to hunt something. That wouldn't be a symbiotic relationship. So it's got to be two different species. And the three examples of symbiotic relationships we're going to focus on in this video and are the most widely accepted are commensalism, which is an interaction between two organisms where one benefits and the other is kind of neutrally impacted. I would say unaffected. Unaffected. Parasitism is a relationship in which one organism benefits and the other one is harmed. And the third one would be mutualism in which both organisms benefit. So in looking at these uh, examples that we've got up here, we have a shark swimming and the shark is going to live its life and eat its food and swimming around underneath it are some fish. Do you know the name of those fish by chance? I don't. Um, but these fish feed on basically the leftover scraps and, and bits that fall out of the shark's mouth. So the benefiting organism would be the fish uh, and the sharks are pretty much unaffected completely by those fish existing and swimming around them. And a lot of times when I talk to students, they think that these are more of a parasite relationships where they are sucking on or they're attached to the shark and they're not. They're simply just trying to get food bits that the shark isn't utilizing. So the next one we have is parasitism, which as Mr. Pfeiffer said, is a relationship where one is benefiting at the harm of another. We've got a picture of a tick. Right. Um, in case you're curious why ticks are so hard to pull off of you, there it is with its head buried in the skin of a human. And um, they are burying themselves so that they can engorge basically on blood, utilizing very little energy. Absolutely, yes. And they can stay attached for a very long time. So you in this relationship would be negatively impacted by the tick. Ticks also can sometimes spread disease, which is another negative impact mm -hmm. other than the discomfort and loss of blood that you suffer from. Right. Um, and then the tick is obviously benefiting because it's gaining a food source. Other examples of parasitism would be things like the mosquito and then a variety of worms. Tapeworms? Yeah, tapeworms are rough. A couple more examples of parasites because who doesn't love a good parasite example? I love um, them. There's something called the tongue-eating louse, Whoa. which uh, affects fish. In case you didn't know, some fish have tongues. Uh, but this tongue-eating louse swims into the mouth of a fish and actually consumes the tongue. It eats the tongue of the fish and attaches itself in the mouth of the fish. And then every time the fish opens its mouth after that to eat, uh, that tongue-eating louse is attached inside of the mouth of the fish and eats the food that the fish is trying to eat. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that once it's attached, the fish cannot unattach. Correct. Yeah, it's uh, quite uncomfortable for the fish. It loses its tongue and has a, a big uh, louse stuck in its mouth for the rest of its life. Um, I'm glad that it's a tongue-eating louse on fish and not people. It's a good day to not be a fish. Yeah. Uh, mutualism is our final type. Uh, we have the famed anemone and clownfish. Thank you, Nemo. Yeah. One of the most well-recognized examples of symbiotic relationships or symbiosis on the planet. So what's actually going on with these two? So the anemone has stinging tentacles. And for most organisms, if you touch an anemone, including humans, it will sting you much like a jellyfish will. The clownfish has developed kind of a toxicity immunity which basically means it is completely unaffected by the stinging tentacles. It doesn't mean that the anemone isn't stinging it, it's just that it has become kind of used to the stinging tentacles, and so it gives the fish a home that no other organisms, including predators, can get into, but the benefit of the anemone is that because the fish is spending so much time around in the anemone and um, excreting waste, that the anemone can then benefit from the waste and nutrients in the waste of the fish. Yes, they are filter feeders, and so they're not moving around to get food. So by the clownfish swimming in and living in, in and around their organism, uh, it's basically bringing food right to them. So it's a great mutualistic relationship where both benefit from this grouping. And when you are taking your notes, one thing that I would highlight or one thing that I would make sure to include is that commensalism is what we call a plus neutral or a plus equal yep. sign. Uh, parasitism would be a plus minus interaction and mutualism would be a plus plus interaction. Absolutely. The, the next kind of interactions that we have for species 
is one that hopefully we're a little bit familiar with based on what we've talked about in class, but that's the idea of a keystone species. A keystone species being a single species within a community that happens to exert much more or stronger control on the entire structure of the community that it exists in. And remember, the definition of a community is all of the different organisms among all the different species in the same place at the same time. We are not talking about the abiotic factors within the community. However, I believe that keystone species are fundamental on impacting both biotic and abiotic factors. Yes, most keystone species do affect both living and non-living factors in an ecosystem. Up here we've got a sea otter, which would be the keystone species um, sort of off of our coasts in the kelp forest community or ecosystem where you have kelp, which is your producer, and which are these big long strands that attach themselves to rocks almost like an underwater forest. And sort of primarily as the base of the food chain in that northwestern territory. Yes, absolutely. And then sort of the urchins, which are piled on the stomach there of the otter, is what consumes kelp. And then the otter eats the urchins, as you can see here. Um, otters actually crack them open with rocks. And they take little rocks and, and bash open the, the urchins and consume them. And what happens in this ecosystem is if the otters are lost, which we had a, a large decrease in the otter population historically in the early 1900s due to some hunting that was going on. When that occurs, you see a dynamic shift in the entire ecosystem, resulting in all levels being affected. So not just affecting the population of their food source, but seeing a dramatic shift in the populations of all organisms within the ecosystem. Yes, completely changing the dynamics of the full ecosystem. It's a big deal. There are a variety of other keystone species we could talk about, uh, but the, for the purposes of keeping the video short, we'll just focus on the otters. All right. Thank you so much for being here. That's it for this video. If you like it, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time.